Chapter 6 of the Gospel of John is a lengthy chapter, and there is a great deal of rich content that can be found in it. The theology that we find here in chapter 6 is thick and rich, and it feeds the soul. There are two signs and then a teaching discourse in chapter 6. And so we will take both parts here in turn. The first part about the signs, focusing on the first sign here for a moment, serves as a visible illustration of the teaching discourse that will come later. So the signs are given up front, and then, if you will, an exposition of those signs follows. The illustration, the signs, however, have both a positive and a negative side to them. That is to say, positively, the sign here, now focusing on the first sign, the sign of Jesus feeding the multitude serves as an illustration, it's an illustration, it's a sign of His saving work as Him who is the bread of life. Negatively, as elsewhere, He uses the earthly bread as a contrast to the heavenly bread. So the earthly bread that He gives to feed the multitude is not the ultimate bread that the multitude ought to crave. Rather, the multitude ought to crave the heavenly bread, such that His hearers are exhorted to not seek the former, namely the earthly bread, but rather to seek the latter, the heavenly bread. The second part is a didactic discourse. Now, there's a lot here, more than we can possibly cover in any extensive detail in the course of this particular lecture, but our focus here will be upon particularly Jesus as He reveals Himself as the bread of life. Our focus will be upon here Jesus as He reveals Himself as the bread of life. Here again, the heavenly and earthly are contrasted. Jesus proclaims Himself as the true bread. And remember what that word true means. It means from heaven. He is the true bread that comes down from heaven. So first, the signs that illustrate the person and work of Jesus. For our purposes here, our primary emphasis will be upon the feeding of the 5,000 in verses 1 through 15, though certainly not to the exclusion of the sign that Jesus performs when He walks on the sea, verses 16 through 21. And in fact, our first observation does include both of those stories. So here's the first observation about both of those stories. There is one thing that should be noted about both stories, particularly as emphasis is given in these stories upon the grassy mountain on the one hand and the still sea on the other. Now, there are some features of these two accounts that bring to mind Psalm 23. The detail in verse 10 about there being much grass And then later on about the calming of the sea gives us the hint here that we ought to be thinking of Psalm 23. And these two signs, the feeding of the multitude and the walking on the calm sea, Jesus shows Himself to be the Good Shepherd of His people. And He makes His followers, you see in verse 10, to lie down in green pastures, And so he satisfies there all of their needs. And so he shows himself as the good shepherd who gives of such abundance to his people that they shall not want. He feeds them. And he feeds them, you will notice here, in no small quantity. Sort of like the abundance of wine at the wedding of Cana in chapter 2. So now here there is an abundance of bread. There are 12 baskets, in fact, of bread that are left over. Indeed, He has prepared a table for His sheep, and their cup does overflow. But here is also the calming of the waters. After 
he feeds his disciples and the crowds to such an extent that they have no want. Now he leads his disciples by still waters. He leads them safely to the other side of the sea. Though they go through the watery valley of death in tumultuous conditions, he arrives to comfort them. And he tells them in verse 20, do not be afraid, such that in verse 21, they are glad and they take him into the boat. And then he delivers them safely home to the other side. You see, Jesus is the Lord. These two signs reveal Jesus as the Lord God of Israel. And as such, he is Israel's good shepherd who cares for them in their wanderings. This is a theme we'll develop more later on in chapter 10. Also, note how Jesus is portrayed here as, verse 14, the prophet coming into the world. This is possibly a reference to the prophet that is like unto Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy 18.15. But the story has other Old Testament forerunners as well, Old Testament parallels. The first Old Testament parallel is found in 2 Kings chapter 4. There we are told about the prophet Elisha, and he performs many signs, including multiplying oil for the widow, verses 1 through 7 of 2 Kings 4. Elisha also multiplies the grain and the barley loaves, verses 42 to 44 in 2 Kings 4. So, the theme of multiplication and the multiplication of sustenance is clear here in 2 Kings 4. So that now the connection that we ought to begin to see here becomes at once clear. Jesus, like Elijah, provides a table feast for his sheep, and his people shall not want as he comes as the prophet into the world. The second Old Testament parallel has in view the abundance of the meal. And here I'm thinking of Isaiah chapter 25 verses 6 and following, Isaiah chapter 49 verses 9 and following. In this way, the the signs that Jesus performs parallels, as we indicated earlier, also the miracle at Cana. Together, the miracle at Cana and the miracle on the grassy mountain hearken back to the witness of Isaiah, particularly as Isaiah is relaying to us a vision of the future, and the vision of a future that is characterized by the abundance of bread and wine. We indicated this already in a previous lesson. But in Isaiah 25, just to refresh our memory, Isaiah 25, verse 6, it says this, On this mountain, notice the mountain that is referred to here, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. And then later on, he goes on in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 49, where it says this, Thus says the Lord, In a time of favor I have answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant people to establish the land, to approbation of the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, Come out, to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways. On all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind, nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. In Isaiah 49, we are introduced to the servant of the Lord. In verse 8, we see it speaks of the coming restoration of Israel. 
Presumably, this restoration will be accomplished by the suffering servant. And in this restoration, verse 9, the prisoner will be set free. Those in darkness, we are told, will see a great light. And like sheep, we are told, they will feed during their sojourning. Even on the heights of a mountain, there will be pasture for them. And so they will neither hunger nor thirst, verse 10 of Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 49, and they will be guided by springs of water. The parallels here in Isaiah to Psalm 23 are, in fact, noteworthy. For the servant of the Lord is identified here with Israel's good shepherd. Third, the Old Testament parallel that is found in Exodus and the desert wanderings. Now, this too is not dis disconnected from Psalm 23. Some scholars have noted that Psalm 23 is a sojourner's psalm. It tells of God's shepherding care for His people as He leads them from the harsh realities of wilderness life into a verdant land of milk and honey. Be that as it may, what is clear here is the way that the Lord feeds His people. He gives them everything that they need. Even when they have nothing themselves, He cares for them, He ministers to them. Though they are in a barren land, the Lord sustains them with supernaturally provided bread from heaven. Now, this theme we will develop as we look at the didactic section. And so, let's go ahead and move there now to the didactic discourse that is found in verses 22 to 59. Having established the meaning and the significance in the Old Testament background of the signs that he performs in the first part of chapter 6, here now we move to the second part of chapter 6 as Jesus expounds the meaning and the significance of the signs that he just performed. So, the discourse proper really begins, though, at verse 35. But the dialogue preceding the Bread of Life discourse is exceedingly important for setting the stage. The disciples are, are seeking Jesus as He has gone to Capernaum, and Jesus issues a rebuke to them. Why does He issue a rebuke? For, for seeking Him for all the wrong reasons. Now, of course, this is nothing that, orig that is new or original to the disciples. People have been trying to seek Jesus for all the wrong reasons ever since and even before. Why are they, why are they seeking Him? Verse 26 makes clear they seek Him for the free bread. They are to, to move then their searching, Jesus says, from seeking perishable bread to that bread which gives eternal life, verse 27. This is given and received. This bread is given and it is received by faith in Him who was sent from God, verse 29. Then they will ask Him for a sign, verse 30, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, that they would ask for a sign because He's just given them a sign. They then talk about how, how the fathers ate bread from Moses, verse 31. And Jesus is quick to correct them that it is God who gave the bread, not Moses. But God gives a different kind of bread now, and this is Jesus' point for which He rebukes them. God is giving them a different kind of bread, a better bread, a bread from heaven. They are excited about this bread. Give us this bread. Give it to us always. Now, this dialogue reminds us of Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well. She, too, wanted water that would quench her thirst forever. Give me this water always, she says. She's thinking of earthly water. She's thinking of Jesus as somebody who will make her life more convenient, easier, and she misses the entire point of what Jesus is bringing altogether. She misses the point of what Jesus is communicating to her. 
just as here the disciples are missing the point of what Jesus is communicating to them, namely that the water that he brings, that the bread that he offers is water and bread that leads to eternal life, not to the sustenance of mere temporal life. And so that brings us to verse 35, which really does begin the bread of life discourse proper. The disciples don't seem to be picking up on what Jesus has been saying. This idea of slowness to understand is a theme throughout the Gospel of John, and frankly, it's a theme throughout the Synoptic Gospels as well, the way in which the disciples are slow to understand. We saw it before with Nicodemus. He didn't get the heavenly meaning of what Jesus was saying about being born again. The woman at the well is slow to understand the heavenly nature of the water. And here the disciples are slow to understand the true meaning of this bread that comes from heaven. So Jesus just comes out and says it plainly, I am the bread of life. Those who come to him will never hunger. The satisfaction of hunger, however, is not of a this-worldly kind of satisfaction. It is entirely redemptive in nature, and therefore it is better than a this-worldly satisfaction of earthly provision. It is entirely redemptive in nature, and it is eschatological in its scope. For this bread that has come from heaven is the last and final bread that mankind will ever need for life everlasting. This bread comes from heaven, and it is to redeem all those that the Father has given him. And these, those that the Father has given him, Jesus goes on to explain, he will never cast out that this assurance of never being cast out is eschatological, is made clear in verse 40, because Jesus explains that those who believe upon the Son, the Son will raise up on the last day. Now, it's worth our attention to unpack the rich doctrine of salvation that's in view here. Here we have, in sort of a nutshell, in this section of John 6, the glories of the Reformed Ordo Salutis, or the Order of Salvation. Embedded, as it were, within the redemptive historical truth of what is being proclaimed here is the glorious Ordo Salutis of a Reformed soteriology. Jesus comes from heaven. What does that mean for His people? When He comes as the bread of heaven, He comes to save all those that the Father has sent him to save. And since he comes to save those that the Father has sent him to save, he saves them completely and to the uttermost. He saves them, and only them. Not one more, and not one less. Only them. Only them will come to him, he explains. And the bread from heaven, we are told by Jesus, will preserve those who come to him even unto the end. So all those that the Father has sent Jesus to save will come to him, and he will by no means cast them out, but preserve them unto the end. Now, special attention at this point has to be given to verses 53 to 58. This passage explains, in other words, what it means to come to Jesus. Here our Lord uses the language of eating and drinking, and He says in verse 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood. Verse 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood. In verse 55, my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The connection with the sign back in verses 1 through 15 of the feeding of the multitude is clear. 
Just as Jesus gave bread which sustained his disciples, so Jesus is himself a better kind of bread, namely one from heaven. Those people on the mountain who received that physical bread would hunger again. After all, such, such earthly bread perishes. It's temporal. And as such, that earthly bread that was given to the multitude on the mountain was only a pointer. It was only a sign. It indicated something beyond itself, another kind of bread, a better bread, a heavenly bread. Jesus is the bread of life that sustains His people, not just temporally, but forever. And so, to eat His body and drink His blood means to feed on Him. It means to feed on Him by faith. And most certainly, Jesus is not thinking of feeding on Him in a carnal manner. That was what the Jews thought He was saying, that He was telling people to literally eat His flesh. And the problem with the Jews was not that they lacked the proper metaphysical categories to grasp the Lord's teaching. It is not as if here the Pharisees, if they just had Aristotle, or Thomas Aquinas, they would better be able to perceive the meaning of our Lord, that He's really talking about the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, transubstantiation. But no, they have missed the point completely, and we might add, so has the Roman Catholic Church and its understanding of the doctrine of the Eucharist. Jesus' point all along has not that we need to eat His flesh and drink His blood in a carnal manner, but His whole point all along is that we must feed upon Him by faith in what He has done with His body in breaking it for our sins and shedding His blood for our sins. Now, what then, we might ask, is the relationship between this discourse and the Eucharist? It is often believed, particularly by Catholic scholars, that this is John's version of the Eucharistic account, the Last Supper. That is because, in part, there is no Last Supper account given to us by John in his Gospel. And so they read the language here, eat my flesh, as teaching about the nature of the Eucharist, these Roman Catholic scholars do. That is, that when we eat the bread, we eat the flesh of Christ, as they contend. But Calvin is much more judicious here. With reference to Augustine, Calvin argues, in short, that the bread of life discourse is not to be identified with the Lord's Supper. Rather, it is an event and a teaching which anticipates the Last Supper. And is the the substance of that which the supper later on would become a sign. So, the supper later on becomes a sign of the reality that Jesus here is teaching us in John 6. The supper is the sign. The flesh of Christ that we are to eat is the reality. And we fellowship with the flesh of Christ through the sign when it is received by faith. For when we eat the bread, having already eaten the flesh of Christ by faith, there we really and we truly at the Lord's Supper feed upon Him, not after a carnal, literal manner, as the Pharisees would have it, but rather by faith in a spiritual manner. So much more needs to be said about this chapter. We've only given it a very brief overview. But following our theme, it's important to remember what it is that Jesus is doing here. What is our takeaway? Remember, this is a study in the truth. Jesus is the true bread. Not that the other bread that He fed the multitude with was false bread. No, but the multitude fed upon bread which points to the true bread that comes from heaven and feeds us abundantly unto eternal life. 
Now, this is no Neoplatonic form versus matter thing that's going on here. Jesus, the true bread from heaven, is a redemptive historical reality. Jesus, the true bread from heaven, is indicative of eschatological sustenance. For Jesus brings us to the place from whence he came, even our eternal heavenly rest. In this way, Jesus is the eschatological bread of life. And finally, as we end this lesson, a word of edification. In seasons of doubt, be assured and revisit this passage time and again. There is no more comforting passage in seasons of doubt than this one. For this passage teaches you that your salvation has been secured by Him who is the bread of life, if indeed you have eaten of His body and you have drunk of His blood by faith. Because all who come to Him have been redeemed by His body and blood. And those are the ones that the Father has given Him from eternity past. These are the ones, you, if you are in Christ, you are the one among many who have been entrusted to Him who is the bread of life from eternity past to eternity future. And Jesus, we are told here, will not lose one of those for whom He laid down His life, but rather He will raise you, He will raise us up all again on the last day. And nothing can thwart the work and the will of our triune God. To Him be all praise and glory, both now and forevermore.